My name is Mike Gabin, and welcome to my KSP campaign. We are here with the Karain One, finally making our exit burn after a couple of dozen days orbiting the moon. These folks are finally on their way back home. Well, home as into Kerbin Station, which is in low orbit about Kerbin. And once we get to Kerbin Station, we are going to be docking. We will be getting some of these folks back down to the surface, but then we're going to be immediately refueling and prepping this ship for a trip to Minmus. But that's actually not going to be the main theme of this particular episode. What I really want to talk about in this particular episode is uh, sending uh, one of two more additional vessels that are on our way to Drez. Last episode, um, the Kermes one began its journey towards Drez doing the first part of a burn that will ultimately get them on an intercept course with the dwarf planet. But I want to send two additional support vehicles along with them. In the first one, you're going to be seeing launched and sent on its way in this episode. And uh, actually, one of the things I want to spend most of my time talking about is the window transfer planner mod. <laughs> I've talked about it a fair bit, but uh, that first Drez Explorer was my first time doing an interplanetary uh, transfer using that mod as a guide. And there were some things I think, I, I, well, not I think, I did kind of messed up. They're on their way to Drez. Hopefully they will be. But uh, I don't think I did it quite as well as I did. And I figured out sort of some things of what I did wrong, some things I could do better. So in this particular episode, I'm going to be talking about how to do that window transfer better. But we got a few things to get out of the way. The first of which is this. This is the RMD. And some of you may remember the RMD uh, is an asteroid chaser, one of uh, my bigger of my two asteroid chasers, that uh, in a previous episode, episode 82, it had a mission to uh, rendezvous and capture a D-class asteroid. And while I was doing the arrow breaking, uh, a mishap occurred that I still haven't resolved as to why it happened. The, the rock was not in any way providing any sort of shielding to the vessel, and, well, yeah, things went terribly wrong. And I ended up losing the entire vessel, and moreover, I ended up losing the rock. Now, I ended up right after that pushing another identical RMD straight into the building queue, hoping that I could catch it, and then it became clear that I couldn't catch it, so it ended up continually being pushed out of the priority list, especially once I started preparing for my Drez missions. Um, this didn't matter anymore, so uh, it just get pushed back, pushed back, pushed back, but it snuck its way back in every once in a while, getting a little bit of building happening, and so here it is. So I thought, you know what, I got an opportunity. Why don't I launch it now and see if I can get a D-class asteroid? Now, the asteroid I'm aiming for, the only one that really is available within the next 100 days of encountering Kerbin's sphere of influence is this asteroid WHM755, but it is crossing Kerbin's SOI in only nine days. So we have got to be fast. So I'm time warping here. Uh, you can see it's got a very high inclination. Um, I'm guessing the inclination to be about 72 degrees. So I'm just time warping until I'm underneath uh, its trajectory around Kerbin, and then I'm going to go launching straight at it. And we're off. And whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, oh no! No! Oh, no! Oh, gosh. Okay. Uh, let's just take a look here at the launch pad. Um... Clearly no Kerbals were aboard. Launch pad seems fine, so there's that. Oh, some sort of strutting issue. I gotta learn not to put vehicles straight back in without testing them again. This has happened to me before. One day I will learn my lesson. But anyway, obviously uh, we are not be chasing any asteroids today. So, <laughs> back to Karayan 1, which is now coming in for its first arrow breaking pass woo that was weird suddenly the cloud textures just kind of warped in there <laughs> and i'm taking my arrow breaking a little bit uh more cautiously than i've had in the past i've had a few 
mishaps with air braking, particular with this vessel. Nothing that ended up damaging any Kerbals, but I've lost solar panels, I've lost batteries, and you know, maybe maybe it's time just to sort of take my time with it a little bit. So I'm keeping my, my Apple Apps is fairly high, well above 40 kilometers for this first pass. And everything went fine. In fact, here we are. This is now the second pass coming through Kerbin's atmosphere, bringing our apoapsis down and lowering our speed to a point where we can attempt a rendezvous with the station. But uh, right after this pass, well, you know, uh, the Karayan 3 was right on its heels. Yeah, here comes the Karayan 3. Uh, the Karayan 3 is returning from a mission to go out of Kerbin's sphere of influence and collect some science and gain some experience and then come back. So it's now coming in for its aero braking pass. Again, playing it cautiously, just worrying about making sure to get the capture. You know, I'm thinking at this point here, like I was, I was thinking while I was doing this, man, it's going to be nice to get those deployable heat shields. I bet you you could put on the brakes really well with one of those. And then I realized, well, hang on a second, I do have air brakes. Why don't I put air brakes on these things? I bet you I can dramatically reduce my aero braking time just with some air brakes up there towards the top that I could deploy. Uh, well, some things to think about for next time. Right now we're doing with what we can. This went without a problem. However, the Karayan 3 is not going to be back into Kerbin's atmosphere for another four days. All we did was get a capture. Its orbit's still going out well past the moon. So it's time to get out and see how the Kermes is doing. Last episode, the Kermes performed the first of two burns that's going to ultimately send it on an intercept course with Drez. And it's still several days away from that second burn. So I'm not here to actually adjust its trajectory or anything like that. I'm here to actually take a look at its encounter with Drez because you might recall that uh, I sent it there on a pretty expedient course. <laughs> not an efficient course, but an expedient course. And the uh, transfer burn, or the injection burn, ejection burn, ejection burn, it burned to get out there. It turned out to be cheaper than what the window planner was predicting, but I got concerned a bit about what its capture burn was going to be. So I'm taking a look here. Yeah, it's going to get there on year two, day 267. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the window transfer planner. And what I want to get is a transfer that's pretty close to what I'm doing here. And I'm going to do that by restricting the departure date to being very close to what my actual departure date is here when the burn is, and also restricting the travel time very close to what we got here. There, that ought to do it. So let's plot this. There we go. And what I kind of really want to draw attention to here is that insertion delta V of 3,134 meters per second. Yeah, that's pretty high. That's going to be what my capture burn is going to be at Drez. I was a little bit worried about that, but I think it should be okay. This this vessel is rather overbuilt. And also, uh, there are support vessels on its way there as well. And what I could ultimately end up doing is simply... Um, bailing on those support missions, stealing its fuel if the if the Kermes is in trouble and using that extra fuel to get it back. But those are all things we're not going to have to worry about for quite some time. But what I do want to deal with right now is readjusting my uh, transfer window for these two support vehicles so that they will leave fairly soon but arrive there within about 30 days of the Kermes arriving there, because I don't want the Kermes to have to sit there and wait for a long, 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 long time. So again, a little bit of playing around with the departure times and the arrival times, and I ended up with this window right here. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, add the, a Kerbal Alarm Clock alarm to that, and uh, I'm going to rename this uh, uncrewed and then this will be the window that my support vessels will be shooting for and i'll try and do a better job getting the inclination and especially the ejection angle i think that's the thing i messed up the most with the kermes but with that done it's time for us to get back to the Korean one which is now closing in on Kerbin station after doing oh well a few more arrow breaking passes and uh couple of small burns 
and we're just going to get it in and docked here. And actually, now that we're seeing Curb and Station, actually, I'm just realizing this, in this episode, you've seen every single one of my uh, crude uh, space vessels in this particular episode. I got a lot of Kerbals in space. Uh, the Karayan 1 here, there are five Kerbals here on the Karayan 1. Kerbin Station has three. Uh, the Kermes, which we just left, had four. And the Karayan 3 that we saw earlier actually has six crew. That's 18 people. And this is including four tourists <laughs> that are scattered amongst these vessels as well. And speaking of which, what we're going to do is we're just going to be docking. And then we're going to be doing some crew shuffling. And I did have a Dream Chaser actually sitting on the pad. And I rolled it back because I want to start getting vessels out. I got an Eve window that's like nipping at my heels. And even a Moho window coming up. I don't have time to be doing anything else but thinking about those particular vehicles. So uh, the Dream Chaser got switched back. I'm going to do my min mist mission with the resources, that's people and vessels and fuel that I have in space right now. But I do want to get a few people down. Merlion is going back down um, because that will finish off the tourist contract. And Chrisnik and McNand are going back down because they are ready to level up. And as you can see here, they are taking one of my Kerr uses. Uh, the Kerr use is a good vessel for these folks because there's no pilot on board and a Kerr use has a built-in probe core they can use to manage their descent burn um, and the probe core gets lost though once the orbital module is ejected but then it doesn't matter anymore now gravity is going to be our pilot and finally I really did want to show you this splash down because oh my goodness this is gorgeous so these are the water shaders that come with stock visual enhancements that I've had on, I've had off, but look at that and look at the reflections coming from scatter or off the water. Beautiful. Okay, let's turn the UI back on and we will recover these guys. And with that, I've got myself 1,150 science from this moon mission. That is more like it. Excellent giving me a total of 1,494 science. Yeah, I've botched some of this because I wasn't using lab modules correctly, but I'm using them correctly now and not losing science. So let's get into the <laughs> Research and Development Center. I almost said VAB there. No, the Research and Development Center and spend that science. So I ended up unlocking three nodes. I got the last tier seven node, which was advanced metalworks, uh, giving me some structural parts, some nice structural parts, and a shield docking port. I could certainly use that. And then a couple more tier eight nodes. We got hypersonic flight. I really would like to try and see if I can build myself a space plane, and this starts giving me some of those high altitude jet engines that uh, hopefully will allow me to do that. And high performance fuel systems because I want more bigger parts. So this gives me more 3.75 meter uh, tanks and uh, cryostatic tanks too. To maybe get into a little bit more of the Kerbal interstellar extended stuff. But with that done, let's get back to Kerbin Station and get the Karayan run ready for its mission to Minmus. And the Karayan one has been restocked, refueled, and well partially recruit. So why don't we start off by going for going over the crew that's going to be going on this mission to Mimis. The pilot remains Stala uh, because she is my only pilot. <laughs> She's the only pilot I have in the vicinity so she will still be pilot of the Karayan 1. Uh, and Shell Cow will remain aboard as a scientist. Um, mostly because Shell Cow actually will level up with this trip to Mimis. Actually, Stella will level up too. They'll both go to level two with this, so that's great. Staying aboard the station are going to be my other two scientists I have up here, Bob and Carol. They will continue to work in the laboratory module generating science for me while these folks go off to Mimis. And then finally along for the ride is Bartner. 
Again, my options are limited. He is my only engineer I have in the vicinity. And besides, Bartner has been on this station entirely too long. In fact, actually, this day marks his 100th consecutive day in space. Which, believe it or not, it's not the record. Bill still holds the record at 120, though both of them are going to be kind of uh, blown out of the water, I think, by Glafia, who is... Uh, the third place holder, but is on her way on a two-year mission to Dres. So I think consecutive space records uh, aren't really going to be much of a competition after that. As for the mission, I actually have a number of things I want to accomplish in and around Minmus, but uh, I think I'm going to wait until we're out there to begin talking about them. But they're not going to be out to Minmus for about another week. So uh, we're going to obviously have to revisit them in a future episode and see how all this goes. Right now, though, I do want to get into the main event for this video. This is the Kegel 5. And before I get into what the mission is and the plan is for this vehicle, I want to draw attention to the top left corner. And I want you to note that I don't have the mission clock going there. I have the universal time going there telling me the year and the day number. And more importantly... The actual time of day. I'm going to be using that to time my launch. Now, I did talk about this back in episode 86. Uh, actually, I talked about it much better in the supplement to episode 86. You can follow the link to it if you want. Uh, so I'm not going to go over all that again. It's got diagrams and stuff. I, I think I think if you watch that, it should be understandable what I'm going to be talking about. All that theory is still right, but in episode 86, when I launched the Kermes for the first time, uh, it was the practice that I that I boggled, bungled up. So here I'm going to try and do it better. So here's how it's going to work. I want my ejection angle to be 149.37 degrees to prograde. However, I'm going into an inclined orbit, and I want to have that ejection burn at the point furthest south in that orbit. That means I need to launch at, in this case, an ascending node. That ascending node is going to be 90 degrees ahead of that burn location. So if I take 90 degrees, subtract it from the 149 degrees, that means I need to be 59 degrees from prograde. But <laughs> I'm not going to be performing that burn for another six and a half days. And in that time, Kerbin is moving, and that angle to prograde is also going to move. Now, if you take 6.5 days divided by the 426 days, multiply by 360 degrees, you get 6.3 degrees. I need to subtract that all off. So that gets me 53.07 degrees, or I just call it 53 degrees. Every uh, minute, Kerbin rotates one degree. So that means I need to be 53 minutes ahead of Kerbin's prograde vector. Kerbin's prograde vector is the sunrise terminator, so I need to be 53 minutes ahead of sunrise. Sunrise occurs at 414 every day, so if I subtract 53 minutes from 414, that means I need to launch at 321. And I am time warping to that and getting to that right now. And we're away. So why don't we talk about this mission. So, long-time viewers know that every time I name something the Kegel, it is going to be a lander, more specifically a crewed lander, and that is exactly what this is. This is a crewed lander on its way to Drez, minus all its crew, of course, the idea being that it'll arrive shortly after the Kermes gets there. It will rendezvous with the Kermes, and then two lucky crew members, who haven't yet decided who's going to be, are going to ride this down to Drez's surface. Hopefully, if uh, that's if everything goes to plan. If things don't go to plan, this might end up being just kind of an emergency fuel <laughs> reservoir for that crew so they can just get back. We'll see what ends up happening, but it's going to be there nonetheless. You know, and, and I mean, oh, uh... I've built a few big rockets, or for me, big rockets, in the last couple of episodes, and they've been uh, a lot of these sort of liquid fuel and oxidizer boosters, all asparagusly staged together. And I know that's a very Kerbal thing to do to build these kind of wide rockets like that, but honestly, I like th these are the kind of rockets I really like. I gotta build more things like this. I mean, watch this right here. 
I am very proud of that. That was beautiful. I gotta use more SRBs. I really, really do. Oh, I should also mention I am going into a five degree inclined orbit because that is what the transfer window tells me to do. There, there's our orbit. That'll do. So let's ditch the booster. You can see there I have a single nuclear engine attached to this, but this is not, for the first time, not the Kerbal Interstellar solid nuclear engine. This is the stock LVN Nerva engine. And there are some differences that I'll get to in just a little bit, but one of them is that this does not generate electricity while passive, hence the big solar panel. What I want to do first here is I want to set up this injection burn that will get me to Drez. So I'm going to open up the details on the alarm, which has all the details provided by the window planner mod. And then I'm going to set up my node and I'm going to put it down here at the lowest point, the most southern point of the orbit. And then I'm actually, I'll use the um, show the ejection angle. That will help because uh, I should be about, you know, it's five degrees or so. Oh yeah, six and a half, yeah, five degrees ahead of where that prograde line is. So I'll just sort of eyeball that. And then I'll put in just the amount of prograde that the burn calls for, which is 2006.2. And we'll see how that goes because theoretically, the inclination should be taking care of the normal component to the burn. And then I'll use the advance orbit button to advance my orbit up to the time the transfer window says that I should be doing this particular orbit. And then we'll take a look and see what we got. And upon seeing what I got, I can see here that I am going to ha have to add a little bit of normal. Yeah, I'm coming a bit to the south of the orbit. I need to ha add some positive normal there. I suppose in hindsight that's really not too surprising because if you're off by just even fractions of the degrees on either the inclination or on your ejection angle, which I suppose is inevitable, um, that's going to make a big difference by the time you get out to Dres. But I only ended up adding 220 meters per second of normal. That combined with, I also tweaked the prograde part to 2036.2 meters per second of program for a total burn of 2048 meters per second. And I'm really happy with that because that's actually very, very close to what the window planner was, was predicting for me. Um, I, the amount of normal I had to add is pretty insignificant compared to the amount of prograde. It's only about 10% the amount of prograde, so it's not affecting the total burn all that much. And it's getting me there pretty close. Uh, it's actually seven days ahead of where the transfer planner was telling me I was going to get there by. But I am more than happy with that. Now, overall, though, this is a 13-minute burn. So, um... I'm going to have to, just like I did with the Kermis, I'm going to split this up into two burns. Now the idea is the same as last episode. I'm going to make a node and then I'm going to push it to be in the same location as the uh, final injection or ejection burn is going to be. And then I'm going to start pushing ahead prograde with a little bit of normal in the same proportion um, as, as the prograde to... Uh, create an orbit that will have a period so that when I return back to periapsis, I'll be in time for the transfer. I uh, ran into one problem, though, pretty much immediately, and that is that when I started pushing out up my apoapsis, I started encountering the moon, messing up my trajectory. That's the last thing I want to do. So what I had to do is I had to pop ahead um, a few more orbits move ahead further in time and ended up moving ahead a day in time to get to the point where the moon was out of the frickin' way. And uh, that ended up with me producing this 886 meter per second burn. Um, which will put me into... What I'm shooting for is an, is a is an orbit with a period of six and a half days. That's really more the thing I'm looking for. I just put in the maneuver so I have an idea of how long it's going to be so I know when to start the burn. And by the way, the burn is about six minutes long, so we are coming up to time to start that burn now. And right away, I'm sure people are noticing that different 
animation on the plume coming out of that engine. That is the animation that comes from real plume for nuclear engines. Um, it affects the stock engines like this, but it does not affect the KSP Interstellar Extended engines, which have their default engine plume. Ah, I rather like this. So that's one thing to notice right off the bat because I'm using the stock one. I could, by the way, get into adjusting the configs on the interstellar engines but given the problems I've had with these engines going all buggy on me in the past I don't want to touch config files and it's working so I'm gonna leave it alone anyway let's talk a little bit about the other differences between the stock Nerva engine and the interstellar solid core nuclear engine um, stat wise the stock engine slightly outperforms the interstellar engine both in terms of thrust and efficiency just by a little bit but what it doesn't do is it doesn't generate electricity passively and by that I mean it's only generating electricity while the engine is on just like all the other engines and that really doesn't make sense you have a nuclear reactor on board for goodness sakes it's producing energy all the time you don't turn off the nuclear reactor every time you turn off the engine but I uh, that's the way stocks got it set up so that's why that's sort of the downside of the stock engine you have to use the um, you have to generate electricity in another way and I don't have any other way to generate electricity other than solar and fuel cells at this point in uh, on the tech tree so I have a great big solar panel uh, it has to be big because we're on our way to Dres and the sunshine is going to be a lot dimmer out there thanks to the um, thanks to the inverse square law so I do need this big solar panel mostly to run the antennas the communication antennas that's the thing that's going to be now with the Kermes there is absolutely no way I would have been able to uh, run that thing on solar panels not with the science lab that's on board of it so uh, I'm glad I got the interstellar engines for that I did mention actually when I first started using nuclear engines that the stock engines don't use uh, you can't just use liquid fuel as a propellant. You have to fill the tanks with liquid fuel and oxidizer just like you did with the regular chemical rocket engines. Well, somewhere along the line in some update, that changed. That's no longer the case. So this actually has nothing but uh, liquid fuel on it, just like I do with the interstellar engines. Now, you can't do things like liquid hydrogen and all this other kind of stuff with the... And, and water. I really want to do water. <laughs> That's always a satisfying propellant to use, but I haven't been able to, I haven't unlocked that ability yet. But um, it's nice that the stock nuclear engines can just use liquid fuel and not have to carry around oxidizer. There is oxidizer though in the lander because the lander runs on regular chemical rockets for the whole landing process. Anyway, why don't we skip our towards the end of this burn? This is. Uh, obviously a pretty tedious thing to watch and you might be noticing if you take a look at the nav ball that I am pointed retrograde because I overcooked it so now I'm burning backwards bringing down my orbital period down to about six and a half days that's what I'm shooting for there there that looks pretty good then it was time to fix up the trans dres injection burn and that turned out to come out to be after I fixed it up um, 1,255 meters per second, uh, and I'm pretty pleased with that. If you it, it, compared to what I did with the Kermes, uh, this is actually coming out much more efficiently. So my extra bit of care with my angle, my ejection angle, and my inclination seems to be paying off, and paying a little bit more attention to the window transfer planner as well. I do have the burn a little bit ahead of periapsis. Uh, I, uh, just just a little bit it, sh it should the burn should still be fine um that was to get it to be I, I again I think I'm just off just a smidge on my ejection angle not too bad but I'm gonna have another opportunity at this with there's a second support vehicle on its way to Drez I got vehicles that are going to be going on their way to Eve and I also have uh, another planned vehicle going to Moho so lots and lots of interplanetary encounters to come uh, but those are obviously going to be for future episodes. I thank you for watching and hope to see you again next time.